musically? Ah, tricky area with me. What do you feel? <laughs> what do you feel about criticism? Because it's the, the old joke is the same old three chords and things like. Are you the sort of person that reads everything and it really winds you up? Uh, initially, the three chord thing was funny, and then after a while, you, you get the strangest people saying to you, "Of course, you're three chords." And I was being interviewed by somebody last year, and she said something to me about the three chords, and I said, "You tell me what a chord is." She said, "No." Nope. I said, "You know how many notes in the chord?" She said, "No." Nope. I said, "So you know what you're talking about?" She said, "No, I shouldn't have said that." She said, "I said no." Um, <laughs> and most of the best music I've ever heard is usually over three or five chords, yeah. whether it's country rock or some opera, some of the arias are three chords. Some of the best classic main sections that we all love are three chords. And uh, I, I always felt that if it, if it meant by moving a finger to make another chord, look at that magic, um, <laughs> does that make the music any better? You either like it or you don't. Yeah, and it, melodies always got to me. But people did spring to your defence. A music teacher, Ruth Green, actually compared your music to uh, Mozart, your particular composing skills to Mozart. And I must stress to people at home that this clip is not a wind-up, it's not a Monty Python sketch. This <laughs> is a real interview. The music is complex. It sounds simple, but it's complex. And they're very, very clever composers. When did you discover, in that sense, status quo for yourself? Oh, uh, May, I think. I was listening to Lies, you know, and I was listening to the sort of... Just suddenly discovered the bass part was moving um, tonic, subdominant tonic, uh, uh, dominant tonic, which is fourth, uh, first, fourth, fifth, and back to first chord. But why did you put an album of status quo on your particular record player? Why then? I mean, how, how did you discover them? <laughs> Well, because I was um, psychologically in distress. <laughs> terrible, you get this superb intellectual critique of your music, saying how wonderful you are, and then right at the end she goes, but I do have a bit of a problem. Well, not well, up here. <laughs> I think a lot of people must have seen that and thought, what has she done to her hair? Yeah, well, it was so Except for it? Brian May, who's looking at <laughs> Whoa! That is a good look! That's what I know. I bet. <laughs> now, by the mid 70s, you were huge. And uh, obviously, with success in rock and roll, uh, excess comes along. Mm. Uh, here's your uh, co guitarist, uh, Rick Parfit. I thought we'd go out one day, so I went and knocked on his door and uh, just sort of walked in. And uh, it was 14 girls in his room. I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, you know, rock and roll, this is, this really is a rock and roll site, you know. I sat on the windowsill and three or four on the windowsill, and four or five on the bed, chairs, sofas, girls everywhere, you know. And uh, just laying there in the middle of it. Hello there, you know. Not a bad life, really. Pretty rock and roll, that was. Sort of always had that picture, you know, of opening the door. Wow. I only had 12 girls in my room. However, it sounds fantastic, but you know, yeah. if you're in a situation downstairs in a hotel or a club, and four or five guys will be after the same woman, or you know, and you get the woman if you get the woman, and you walk out, <laughs> and you get in the elevator, and oh, wait, and you get in your the room and go, why did I do this? And then you realise you've got to perform, and that's after, well, very soon for me when. I've done that, yeah. Mm. I, I mean, like I, what they're wearing, and they always took their kit off. I go, why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> now, the rock and roll excesses weren't just uh, uh, sex, obviously. Uh, there were drugs, and rather a lot of them. Uh, here's your former tour manager, Bob Young. I believe that uh, quite often Francis and Rick would test just how far out of it and how far gone they were by running into walls and when they were bouncing off, if it didn't hurt, then they knew that they'd had enough. Good job you hadn't been on Viagra, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, though, was your drug of choice? What they called drug of choice? What was your biggest downfall? <laughs> Lead him in. Uh, cocaine. But I used to see people doing it and think, oh, disgusting, man. It's gross, you know. And someone said, try it. I said, don't be a dickhead, I don't want to do that. And somehow I tried it. And after that, we were doing coke all over the place. And yeah. once we'd started, I had to have coke to get out of bed or to get in the shower. And when you start off with something like a stimulant of some sort, yeah. you, you, if this is a, a, how we live, it is our, our moods. You take your first bit of coke, which has usually got some sort of amphetamine spade coming in. So you're up a little like that, lovely. And then tomorrow, you need a bit more to get to where you are. And then 
eventually you are actually taking the coke to be, or whatever the drug is really, to be exactly where you were when you started. Yeah. I knew it was going on. I used to know by washing my, washing my nose every morning. Mm. And you do these things sit in the deck in the shower and wonder what that was. Mm. Yeah. So what actually happened in the shower? Did you actually lose the cartilage in your nose? It's or? the centre of the septum, no, just right. in there, yeah. But, uh, people have always said, be careful, you get a hole in the septum. I've seen lots of other people around. And it's, again, it's strange why we don't ask each other. We're all kind of in the same business. And I'd see people with little studs and stuff in their nose here and think, well, no, nope, I'm OK. No one said, no, the septum, you dickhead, here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One final question on the drug thing. Got a line before we carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the drug contributed anything musically for you? No, I think that'd be bullshit to say that. I think the drugs make you think that. They're going to remember yeah. it was me that did this and you can't do this without me. Yeah, that's the... And that's it can't be true. Right, well, we've done sex, we've done drugs, it must be rock and roll next. Yeah. Um, now, there was a bit of a split in the band, wasn't there, about whether you should become... A heavy rock group, or, or more of a, a good something time like pop that. Group. Yeah, that's yeah. all right. It, it was Alan, wasn't it, who thought that, that the band should be more serious and manly. He mm. thought your name was girly, didn't mm. he? So, was it in a sense that why you and, and Rick played up the gay thing? Is more probably, than why you yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, he had this thing. He grew up in Peckham, and uh, you didn't, you know, you could people couldn't insult me or Rick without enough hitting them. Yeah. He was just taught to fight. He was taught to never back down. Well, this, this isn't the sort of stuff that Alan particularly liked. <laughs> and this is what he hated to play. It wasn't even him playing that. No, he wouldn't come over, no. It's a dummy. Let's just see the dummy. <laughs> yeah, but Patsy Kensett still married it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was... He wouldn't come over for that song and... Uh, he did very good miming there as well. It's he? fantastic. Well, our manager was working him from the roof. <laughs> what were you saying if we didn't say coke and sulfate then? Yeah, well, no, me and Rick, you'd see co uh, coke or sulfate, we're both sort of sped up there. You can tell yep. by our eyes and our expression. The times we went up to him and spoke to him, thought it was him, was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know what he means because I know where he's coming from, but that was the best thing for us to part at that point because yeah. he was either going to knock me out a few times a week. Or we were going to seriously fight. I don't. I couldn't have fought with that mate. Is he kill you? But you, you even fell out with Rick as well. I mean, mm -hmm. or Rick fell out with you. I don't know how much way it happened. No, the coke does that. You anything that stimulates the body and gives you that confidence all the time. I can do anything. Sod everybody. You know, it, it's going. It just does that. It's going to destroy you, and it did us. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at the, the at the type of row that you used to have. <laughs> Obviously now you've all seen Spinal Tower, everyone's seen Spinal Tower. I'd, I'd just like to draw a few more uh, oh, parallels. No, yeah, no. Here's his status quo when they were the Spectres. And here's Spinal Tap when they were the new originals. <laughs> <laughs> here's Status Quo psychedelic period. And here's the Spinal Tap psychedelic period. Here's Tap bassist Derek Small. And here's Quo bassist Alan Lover. <laughs> here's Tap guitarist David Hubbins. And here's Quo guitarist Rick Parfit. <laughs> here's the other member of Tap, Nigel Tufnell. And there's something awfully familiar about all of that, isn't there, Nigel? Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is. And we, at the time when it first came out, everybody said it was us. And in fact, for a while, the crew would, would do it to us. They'd sort of, I don't know what you know about gigs, whenever you come out, you, there's guides everywhere for the band to go like with big shit. And you go and you follow the white lines. And they did it to us a few times. They'd have blind alleys just for the hell of it. <laughs> I expect you were very comfortable following the white lines, weren't you? <laughs>